During an approach to an airport surrounded by hills, confusion arises among the two pilots of Alitalia 404. According to their instruments, they should be coming in nicely for landing. Something just seems off, but the pilots just can't put their finger on it. Just seconds later, the plane crashes into a hillside. Let's find out what happened here. Subscribe so you won't miss any future episodes. Welcome to Airspace. On November 14, 1990, an Alitalia DC-9 had completed its flight from Frankfurt to Milano, Italy. The flight went well, but there were some minor problems with the navigation instruments. To hopefully fix that issue, both navigation receivers of the plane were replaced during the ground stop in Milano. After a quick check using the local navigation beacon, it was determined that the fix had been successful and the plane was released back to service. The following flight would lead the plane to Zurich, Switzerland. The flight was smooth and without any problems. When the crew was near Zurich, they noted that the weather was cloudy, but otherwise not too unfriendly for a mid-November night in Switzerland. Soon, air traffic control lined the DC-9 up for an approach on a 1-4, Zurich's main landing runway, and the crew began their final approach. At this point, they were about 3 minutes from touchdown. Moments later, the air traffic controller that handled the arrival of Alitalia 404 ordered it to contact the tower frequency. This air traffic controller would then handle the landing of the DC-9. But some minutes later, the air traffic controllers became really concerned. The pilots had never contacted the tower and the flight had vanished from the radar screens. Had the flight gone around? That couldn't be, since it would show up on the radar. But just then, the next arriving aircraft reported that they saw a huge fire under the approach path. The grim reality dawned on the controller in charge and he ordered all planes to divert to other airports. Meanwhile, a state of emergency was declared and the emergency services of the airport and many surrounding counties responded. The crash site was quickly located here, in the small town of Weyach, 5.2 miles short of runway 14. What had happened here? The pilots had not indicated that anything had been amiss or that there had been an emergency. The wreckage of the DC-9 was quickly found, but the aircraft was completely destroyed and a large fire had erupted. None of the 46 souls on board survived. Despite the complete destruction of the aircraft, the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder were found in a good enough condition to be read out. What they contained puzzled the investigators. During the approach, the captain displayed a laid-back, confident and smooth attitude, however he seemed condescending toward the less experienced, quiet first officer. Regardless, the crew managed to bring the aircraft to the horizontal part of the instrument landing system, the localizer. Next, they would arm their systems so that they may capture the localizer and the glide slope. The glide slope is the vertical part of the instrument landing system. The aircraft approached the glide slope from below, as is the case during most approaches. Because the navigation receivers were replaced in Milano, this approach was planned to be flown as a Category 2 approach. That means that the plane's autopilot would use data from both navigation receivers, compare them and only follow them if they were in agreement. This was done to check that the new receivers were working properly. To fly such an approach, the navigation receiver selector needed to be on the setting APP, which stands for Approach. This was the case initially. But now, as the plane approached the glide slope, the captain asked the first officer, Do you have the glide slope? To which the first officer answered, No. Slightly annoyed, the captain then said, Alright, but I see it, let's fly it using 1. At that moment, the captain had a glide slope indication, but the first officer did not. To fix this, the captain switched the navigation receiver selector to 1. This switched the horizontal situation indicators, these are the primary navigation instruments, to be fed from navigation receiver 1, excluding navigation receiver 2. As soon as this was done, the plane captured the localizer and the glide slope and started its final descent. The glide slope was shown as perfectly centered on the captain's and the first officer's instruments. However, what the crew did not realize was the fact that the captain's navigation receiver was malfunctioning and not receiving any indication from the glide slope. Normally, such a failure would be displayed on the instruments with the so-called flag, that is an orange or red tab that flips into view, warning the pilot that his instrument was not displaying valid data. However, the manufacturer of the DC-9's instruments allowed for unflagged failures, meaning that the instrument or the navigation receiver could fail and this would not be presented to the pilot. Instead, the glide slope indication would just center and remain there if no signal was present. Yeah, I do not know who thought this was a good design idea either. Since the navigation receiver selector was on position 1, the same indication was repeated on the first officer's side. 
In this selection, it would actually have been prohibited to fly Category 2 approach, since there were no longer two independent navigation sources for the approach, but the pilots did not realize that. The crew continued their approach, believing all was well. They configured the aircraft for landing and descended on what they believed was the correct glide slope. At 7 miles before the runway, the first officer asked the captain if they had not passed the outer marker yet. This outer marker was a navigation beacon used back in the day to indicate to the crew that they were coming close to the airport. It was also used as a last checkpoint to see whether the plane's altitude was correct, as the outer marker also has an associated altitude published with it. When the first officer asked the captain whether they had passed said outer marker, he must have suspected that something was wrong, since they already were below outer marker altitude. The captain, however, said, no, no, we haven't passed it yet. Oh wait, it shows seven miles? There, a sliver of doubt must have crossed his mind. But just at that moment, the approach controller ordered the plane to contact Zurich Tower for landing, and the captain took the radio call and performed the frequency change. He, however, never checked in with Zurich Tower. Then, the captain said to the first officer, that does not make any sense to me, and the first officer stated, nor to me. Just two seconds later, they must have realized what was happening and the captain called pull up, pull up, to which the first officer immediately responded with go around. He initiated all associated actions, pulled the nose up and decreased engine thrust. However, he was abruptly stopped by the captain who exclaimed no 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 no, recapture the glide slope. The first officer complied and entered more or less level flight, probably in an attempt to follow the captain's command and in order to return to the glide slope. But at this point, it was too late. Seconds after this last conversation, the last words by the captain were uh, Hold on, let's just try to... and then the plane crashed into a forest, 5.2 miles short of the runway, as a hill rose into the aircraft's fly path. Soon after that, the air traffic controller that had handled Alitalia 404 realized that it had disappeared from his radar screen. Puzzled, he called the tower controller to inquire whether the pilots had called in for landing. The tower controller answered in the negative, and confusion arose. Where could the plane be? A bet reality started to dawn on the two controllers. The arrival controller asked another plane on the approach whether they could see the plane in front of them, to which the crew answered, negative, no traffic in sight, but there's a huge fire on the ground. It gave me chills when I read it, and it must have been the case for everyone involved as well. Quickly, Zurich Airport was closed and the alarm was raised. Several questions remain after it became clear why, from a technical standpoint, the plane had crashed. One question was, why did the pilots not realize they were way too low? They should have been able to deduce from their altimeters and their distance to the runway that they were coming in too low. The reason for that might have been the altimeter design itself. The DC-9's altimeter was of the so-called drum pointer type. To read the plane's altitude, one would have first to read this drum here, indicating altitude in thousands, and then the pointer right here, indicating altitude as hundreds. So the indication presented here would represent 2320 feet. Annoying, right? Many studies agreed, some dating as far back as 1959. Most of these concluded that such a type of altimeter presented ample opportunity for misinterpretation. At one point, it was even dubbed the killing altimeter. The investigators strongly believed that an altimeter misinterpretation by the captain played a major role in the accident. Another question was, why did the captain cancel the go-round that the first officer had initiated? His exact motives remain unclear, but they tell the same story as when he switched the navigation receiver to 1. Instead of properly rectifying a problem, he again decided to shut down his only warning, in that case the first officer. Also, the interpersonal relationship between the two pilots was not ideal, and it is unfortunately common that first officers do not insist on their point of view when they are overridden by the captain falsely. The first officer must have realized that something was wrong, otherwise he would not have attempted to go around. Sadly, there are many accidents that feature this component. But luckily, the industry has also learned from past mistakes. In most airlines today, both pilots are eligible to order a go-around at any time and such a decision shall not be reverted under any circumstances. In the end, this accident was a chain of procedural lapses, lack of monitoring and poor crew resource management. An approach should not have been made so carelessly by simply switching the navigation receiver signal to a single source and without any cross-checks regarding aircraft altitude. The first officer should have spoken up earlier and the type of altimeter used should have been abolished decades ago. I'm glad the industry has learned from the mistakes and that cockpits nowadays are a little more modern.
even though there is still a long way to go until aviation catches up to modern technology. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked the video, leave a like and check back next week for another aircraft accident report. See you then.